This week on Information Technology Leaders, Evan Kaplan, CEO and co-founder of Aventail. Now here's your host, Laura Schildkraut. Today's guest is the president, CEO, and co-founder of Aventail Corporation, a company that provides secure, managed extranet and access services for global enterprises. As a teenager, he became a nonconformist by choice, if not by birth. He had no interest in following his grandfather and father into business, let alone entrepreneurship. He would rather climb mountains than corporate ladders. Over time, he would climb both. Almost by accident, he's created a career that appears perfectly crafted. And now, as if to come full circle, he's become the entrepreneur he swore he would never be. I guess some of us are destined to a certain direction, and maybe that's not a bad thing. Please welcome Evan Kaplan. Where did you grow up? I grew up in New York, Long Island. And what were you like in high school? I was probably started the nonconformist in high school. Um, so sort of in a different crowd, not in the main crowd. And what kind of stuff did you read in high school? I read sort of everything, but I actually read a lot of existentialist literature in high school, <laughs> things like that. Sort of that things that were sort of nonconformist, yeah. yeah. When I think about most teenagers, it <laughs> seems like everything that they want to do is conform. They just want to be like, like their friends and like everybody else. Why did you want so desperately to be on that other path? I think for me, on a personal level, um, I lost my dad when I was in high school and so went through a period of time where doing things the way everybody was doing, which I had probably done up to that point in junior high school and high school, just didn't seem all that appealing. And I just started this hankering that there needed, there needed to be something different. And I could see how everybody's lives were sort of preset. At least, mm -hmm. at least I noticed that more in high school than I do now. And I didn't want to choose the life that was probably in front of me, which was to mm -hmm. be a doctor or a lawyer and stay in New York mm -hmm. and live in what was a predictable life. Right. You, under, you know. Yeah, no, I do, I do yeah. understand that. But it turns out that your father and your grandfather were both sort of businessmen and they both had this entrepreneurial spirit. Was it that same thing that made you not want to follow that path? Because that's not doctoring or lawyering. You know, it's interesting. I didn't even think very much about my father and grandfather, and both grandfathers being entrepreneurs until sort of later in life. I wouldn't have defined them as entrepreneurs. I would define them as having hard jobs and going to work every day, and they happen to own their own small companies. But I sort of never thought of them as entrepreneurs. It's almost like the language or the word mm -hmm. wasn't there for entrepreneurs. They just... Right. They just went to work and had a business. I think it is kind of a newer word. Yeah. Because you know, I guess my, my dad owned a hardware store while right. I was Same growing up, and I guess I never really thought of him as an entrepreneur either. You never would have called them entrepreneurs. Right. 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 And also, they didn't think about business in terms of huge companies, right. a lot of employees. They didn't think on those kind of grand mm -hmm. scales. They thought about, you know, how do we build a small business that generates a lot of cash and not too much aggravation. Right. So. And did they do that? Yeah, they did a pretty good job at it, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Between high school and college, you traveled through Europe. What was the best and the worst about that trip? Oh, boy. Um, well, the trip was sort of an adventure for me. You know, I went alone. I went with a backpack. I didn't know anybody. I didn't know anything. Um, I'd never, you know, I'd never sort of traveled abroad like, certainly not like that. And um, the worst of it was the, was the first part of it where I, I arrived there and, um, and was just downright sad and lonely. I mean, I really was profoundly lonely in a way that you can't be when you're in your house or when you're your right. friends or things like that. And I remember, you know, sitting in Copenhagen and it was pouring rain and I was just sitting outside and I was, was, um, was trying to get a bus to catch a train and the whole thing and just thinking, what did I do here? Just thinking it was crazy. And it was a different kind of loneliness. I think the best of it was probably just four or five days later when I started to connect with other people and started to feel like mm -hmm. the spirit of independence, like I had somehow pulled it off and I was going to make it. I wasn't going to run home or anything like that. So yeah, It reminds me of when I went to Greece by myself for the first time and thought I was going to be part of this tour group only to find out that I wasn't. <laughs> and I remember getting on the phone and being ready to call my parents and tell them what had happened. And then I realized that if I tell them this, they're going to be panicking for the next 10 days, and they're going to tell me to come home, and right. I'm not coming home. Right. And it was like the first time I think I realized that they can't fix everything. Yeah. And it was... And actually, that was somewhat similar. I could not tell my mother. I could tell my brothers how right. lonely I was, but I couldn't tell my mother. Right, because she'd so, try to fix it. Yeah, she'd make me fly home. Right. <laughs> Um, in further an attempt to try and be, be different, you applied to eight Canadian schools instead of applying <laughs> to anything in the United States. But you ended up going to a school in New York. How did, how did all that come about? I really wanted to go to McGill. 
in Canada. Mm -hmm. That's where I really wanted to go. And I wanted to go, I should have known then, this was really before I got into climbing very much, but I was really, I really wanted to learn how to ski. And so McGill was really close to the ski area. So it wasn't like I went, wanted to go to McGill because it was For such a great school. Because right. one, it was in a cool city. I really right. liked Montreal. And two, it was close to skiers, but I didn't get in. So I decided not to go. And then there was a small state school in upstate New York that was close to a ski area. So I went there instead. <laughs> And then I believe that during that time you took an outdoor um, leadership class. How did that affect you? Uh, that, was, that had a profound impact on me. So I was, I was sort of looking for this notion of adventure and what adventure meant and all that sort of stuff. And so as a kid, and we share some similar backgrounds as we've right. talked about, as a kid I was terrified of even camping out. Let alone, when other kids would go camp out, I didn't even want to sleep out at night. I would stay up all night tending the fire <laughs> for fear of the, the whatever. And so it seemed like a challenge to me to do something really outdoor oriented and I was not prepared but I went to take this class, Knowles class in Utah and it had such a huge impact on my life. I not only found that I liked it, I found that I loved it and I had a passion for it and it just sort of opened up a whole world. It, it is probably the single most opening thing in my mm. adult life. Yeah. So. I think it also starts to create that theme of going after things you're afraid of rather than shying away from them and I yeah. think that, that I think that theme was created through. from that when that first trip to Europe but yeah. Did you end up graduating from SUNY Cortland? No, I came out here. So I stayed there for two years um, and after I'd gone. So after the summer I had come out and done that course in Utah, I hitchhiked to visit a friend who had moved to Port Angeles to do some construction work. And so I had never even, I didn't even go to Seattle or Bellingham or any of those places. I just went straight to Port Angeles and, um, and decided that this was a neat place because I went up to see the Olympics and, and that. And so um, I went back to school that year and decided to transfer out here, and I transferred to Western. Um, they had a great environmental science program, but they were you know, right in the middle of the Cascades, mm -hmm. or at least what I knew. Right. Okay. Yeah. And what degree did you end up getting? An environmental science degree. And at that point, you also got involved with Outward Bound. Yeah. What, what was your involvement with them? I worked on and off for Outward Bound for about three years. Um, and I worked in, I worked for Outward Bound, but I worked for an offshoot bunch of ex-Outward Bound folks who started a program with the state of Washington to take delinquent kids from the state institution and do these 24, 28-day courses in the mountains. And so it was a really nice combination. It combined sort of the whole psychological and therapeutic aspect of outdoors, but with the hard sort mm -hmm. of challenging aspect of it. Yeah. What are some of the things that you learned by dealing with that group of kids? Wow. Um... You learn, well, you don't learn compassion, but you see a situation in a broader context that you could take these kids and you could take them out of their normal environments and their behaviors um, would be markedly different. And then we'd work with them a little bit afterwards and you can see how easy it was to shift back into mm -hmm. everything they'd been conditioned. And uh, You also learn just how amazing people are under pressure, mm -hmm. the things that they can do when the chips are down. So we would do solos where they'd be alone for four days in the winter digging snow caves. I mean, these are kids who people had said, you know, they're not, you know, basically everything they've tried have failed. And they were successful on these courses. And so that, that was a rich experience. Yeah. I also learned that it, it's hard to be responsible for 13 people in the middle of the winter in the mountains. Yeah. So it's hard to be responsible for 13 people yeah, in the middle responsible. of the city. That's true. I'm barely <laughs> responsible enough for myself, let alone for 13 other people. But. And then you eventually started working for Outward Bound after you graduated. How, how long did you end up working there? About three years. So um, actually the course that I took in Utah wasn't Outward Bound. That was a whole, mm -hmm. that was Knowles National Outdoor Leadership School. And I worked for Outward Bound first as an intern and then as an employee for, for about three years. And why did you eventually leave? You know, it got to the point where I was really in love with a lot of the climbing and you know the, the schedule that I was working I was living in the U district here at the time and the schedule you'd work is I'd work you know 30 days on and 30 days off what I'd find is after being out in the mountains in the middle of the winter for 30 days with you know with two other instructors and you know nine other kids that when I came in all I wanted to do was you know hang around town and drink lattes and things like that and so I wasn't doing as much climbing stuff as I wanted mm -hmm. so I really wanted to change my life a little bit to be able to do that for fun mm -hmm. as opposed to work. Plus it's hard, it just mm -hmm. got hard. Was it hard not really having a home? Well, we had, actually I felt very much like we had a home. We lived in a group house with seven or eight. Some of them were instructors, some of them were graduate students. It was actually a really rich time. In terms of you'd come home and you know, everybody would share meals and things like that, so. And what are some of the skills that you took away from, from that whole experience? 
Um, I think that, you know, the formative stuff there is around leadership, what it takes to get people going, to get people um, in a direction, to paint a vision or a picture of what, what is at the end of an adventure like that. Um, I just, it was such a natural evolution for me. It, it was something that I was starting to, you know, something that I had come to enjoy and have a passion for. It was easy to start sharing with the other kids and then under adverse conditions made it mm -hmm. all the more interesting. Mm -hmm. So. And then before you, you went to get a job, you decided to go back to school. Where, where did that end up taking you? I went back to school. I decided, after being for three years on and off in the mountains quite a bit, I decided I wanted to try to get, by that time I had certainly gotten the notion that I wanted to kind of get in the world of business. And I, I was pretty divorced from that whole process. I had not gone through the normal, you go to college, you get a job, mm -hmm. and that whole thing. The kind of job I had was a very different kind of job. And so I'd see these people in town going to work and, you know, starting to get to know, and I thought that might be an interesting thing to do. And... Uh, I used some of the skills, the leadership skills, the communication skills, the organizational development skills that I had developed in leading groups in Outward Bound to work with managers. So I moved into the HR department at this mm -hmm. company, LDEC, first as an intern and then very quickly as an employee to do organizational development, communication skills for managers, things like that. And what did the company do? It was in aerospace. So we made flight computers for Boeing, Airbus, a variety of different aerospace manufacturers. Something I had no experience with. Let alone, you know, I was 25 years old, 24 years old. I had never worked in a corporate setting. And here I was training managers on communication skills. It's kind of have, you kind of have this imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. Like, what am I doing here right. and why? But, and they're going to find me out. Right. They're Somebody's gonna... going to discover right. that, in fact, I know nothing about this stuff. Right. And, and uh, how did your first day at the job go? The first day at the job, I'm sort of all dressed up. And I, you know, I had in one, clothes, one yeah. suit my whole life. And it was a suit I got bar mitzvahed in. Um, and now I had to go out and buy a sport jacket and slacks and those sorts of things. And I had one of those, you don't see them anymore, but one of those crochet ties, those knit yeah. ties. We used to are, call them sock ties. Yeah, yeah, right. They look like a sock and they're cut off at the bottom. So I'm walking around with my rubber sole shoes and my crochet tie and my sport jacket. And I met a senior, a senior executive at the company. And uh, um, I lean over to shake his hand. He's showing me something on the desk. And I proceeded to put my crochet tie right in his coffee. <laughs> and so I, I leaned over and it's sort of this moment of like, okay, if I pick the tie up, I'm going to leak all over his desk and the papers. But at the same time, because it's a crochet tie, it's wicking. So it's sort of wicking towards my neck. And so if I don't lift my head soon, <laughs> it's going to, you know, it's going to, my whole shirt's going to be sopping wet. So I had to reach across and I had to lift the tie up. I had to squeeze it over the, going to move over the garbage can and, so I walked around the whole day with a totally stained tie. I was afraid to take the tie off because I felt like the tie was the uniform. I was just, that's just an indication of how mm -hmm. out of place I was right. after three years at Outward Bound in that kind of environment, especially aerospace. And then at some point you decided you wanted to be on the revenue side of the business rather than on the training side of the business. How did you make that move happen? I, well, I think it was instinctual for me. You know, I realized that what I was doing was interesting and fun and challenging, and I had a lot of passion for it. But I also realized that those other folks were right in the middle of making stuff that was really important to the company. And you began to see what was important to the company as, you, as I sort of figured stuff out. And so, um, you know, I basically, I did a lot of work for the senior execs as a, in, in leadership and earned their respect. And I said, listen, this is something I want to try. Um, are you willing to take a bet on me? Which is actually, which is actually a theme in my career is asking people if they're willing to take a bet on me. Um, it's and, kind of bold. Yeah. I mean, how do you react if they say no? You know, I probably have hurt feelings like <laughs> anybody else. Um, and I'm sure sometimes if I really thought about it, recounted my career, people have definitely said no. Um, but what people don't realize often is, especially when you're in those kind of roles, People want to help you. Mm -hmm. People generally want yeah. to help, and so if you ask the question in the right way, or if you put it in the right way, and you show some, you know, you show a lot of interest, people are willing to help you. So yeah. they, yeah. They, I, I think sometimes we look at our managers and we forget that they they're there to help us succeed. They're not there waiting for us to make a mistake so that we can fail. Right. And I think we we forget that sometimes. Yeah. I think people also understand what goes around comes around. And what's what's interesting about this story is the guy who took a bet on me, the director who took a bet on me. I was recently trying to, his son just graduated law school, and now I'm trying to help his son, mm -hmm. you know, in some other places. And it just, that cycle goes around and around in my career in a variety of different places, where people try to help each other, and you go out of your way to help each other, and it comes back to you. 
So I believe at this point you became an associate program manager. Right. And you ended up working a lot with the engineers, but you didn't really know anything about engineering <laughs> specifically. There's another how, theme in yeah, my Another career. theme. How, how did you go about gaining their respect? Um, I think, so while I'm not an engineer, while I couldn't design a circuit, while I'd be probably not be not the best programmer in the world, even if I put all my energy towards it, I, I think that's pretty clear. Conceptually, I really... I was able to understand exactly what was happening. And I think, I mean, some of it's just plain conceptual intelligence. How do these things work? How mm -hmm. should they work? What's a process that makes sense to deliver these kinds of products? And so I think at first I certainly didn't have, I didn't have that respect. I think um, they were going, we know this person is an HR person. Everybody else in these program management roles are engineers. Why is, you know, I could argue there's probably some jealousy. Why is he in this role mm -hmm. and what's going on with that? Um, but I think over time I won their respect and got more and more responsibility. And How did of, you do that, though? I think just by demonstrating a level of competency quickly, mm -hmm. you know, being a quick study, you know, coming home at night and reading books, trying to understand what it means to be an electrical engineer, trying to understand what these systems did. And that to me is, I think, at different parts in your, different parts of your life, your brain grows faster than other parts. And so that was a time where I felt like I could just, I could take in everything. And just with a certain amount of work, I could learn virtually anything. I don't feel that way as easily today, but right. I certainly did then. This company was actually very good to you, considering where you started yeah. and, then, and then where you ended up. I know that they, they gave you three leaves of absence so that you can continue to go climbing. And they also ended up paying for your MBA degree, which you, you did here at, in the executive program. I might also mention you were the youngest person in, in the program. <laughs> did, did you enjoy the MBA? I loved it. And I loved it. Well, it was a, it was a couple of things. Um, I didn't go for the for sort of to get the certificate. I mean, I was, it was like your brain is growing around different things. I was really interested in what it is, how all this worked, because it was all confusing to me. And you have to know I have four or five cousins who are MBAs and MBA, you know, JDs, lawyers at the same time. And so... Um, they had, you know, they had been sort of talking and living this world for a long time, but I didn't have a clue. But as I got into the middle of the business, it was clear to me that there is some sort of way to think about all this, mm -hmm. and I didn't have it. And so getting into the executive MBA... And you've sort been of, faking it long it enough. Me, it's like a great... A good business degree is like a great liberal arts degree in business. Mm -hmm. It gives you a conceptual model to think about things. Plus, being the youngest, being the youngest person in the program, you know, I got to... You know, I was nervous as hell, but... I was with all these folks who were, really had been in 15 or 20 years worth of business, and I was just, I was just soaking it up. Mm -hmm. But then soon after you completed the MBA that they had paid for, you decided that it was, <laughs> that it was time to, to leave this company. Why did you decide to leave, and did you feel at all guilty about leaving so soon after they just invested so much in you? Yeah, I did feel, actually. I, um, that co the company was LDEC, and they were they've re they were bought a few years later by Crane Aerospace. They were enormously good to me. They sponsored me. They allowed me to make these shifts. They also, you know, they allowed me on these three expeditions over the course of six years. And I think what happened for me is it was pretty clear in 1990 that aerospace was really flattening out. And I had to make a career choice was, did I want to wait around 10 more years and maybe become a vice president, which is really, if you get to know me, is just not my my tempo and pace. And so, you know, I offered to pay back the money for the MBA program, and I purposely didn't go right away to another job. That's for a couple of reasons. One is I felt like that would have been, that just would have been inappropriate after they had been so generous with me just to go and take some other job. Um, another is because I had no idea what I really wanted to do next. And another theme in my career is I can't start something new until I finish what I've done. Um, I'm also this when I read books. I can't start another book unless I finish the book that, that I've been working on. And for me, I can't imagine the vision for what the next steps of my life are until I stop doing what I was doing. And mm -hmm. so I took three or four months off after LDEC to go climbing and then decided to look for something else. And then you, you ended up going to a company called WRQ. I'm going to ask you in a moment to, to talk about what that is. But first, I want you to talk about how that interview process went because it, it didn't go exactly smoothly. <laughs> At WRQ? Yeah. Oh, it was interesting. I had, it, WRQ was, in, at that time, it was, a, it was a company doing about $10 million in sales, but it was clear that it was growing. 
And in business school, I got to know a couple of the principals, and one of the principals was actually a climbing friend. Um, and so I went to a recruiter and said I wanted to work there rather than go to the principal, and the recruiter says, the position you're talking about you're not qualified for. Okay, so what else is new? Um, and she discouraged me and would not pass my resume. But I, so I called my friend and I said, well, he said, okay, well, I'll set you up with a partner who runs all the sales and marketing because I'd figured out that I wanted to be in marketing. So I had all this, I had this technical background and now I want to get the marketing background. And he said, um, he said, he surprised me one morning. I was at home. He said, why don't you come in today at one o'clock? And I'm like, you know, I wasn't, I'd been, you know, I'd been on the road and traveling and all that sort of stuff. I wasn't prepared for an interview. So I went to QFC down in U Village and I bought a copy of Byte Magazine. And I didn't know that much. I knew a fair amount about computers, but I didn't know anything about networking. And the job was product marketing manager for all their networking products. And so there was an article on the seven layer model of networking. So I went home and from like nine to 12, I read the article two or three times. I diagrammed it. I wrote it out. I sort of did all this stuff so I could know as much as I possibly could from that one article. And if you know Byte Magazine, it's fairly technical. Yeah. Dance. And so I went into the interview, and by the time I was done with the interview, I had more, you know, I knew more about it than he did, mm -hmm. which was not that, which was not all that, that much. Um, but I was able to at least talk about the lingo, the conceptual model of how this sort of stuff works. And so I went through like 17 interviews. I mean, WRQ was known at this time. First of all, there weren't that many great jobs in high tech. It was, you know, there weren't that many companies around. WRQ would do this consensus approach. I went through 17 interviews, and they gave me the job doing marketing for which. I learned how to be a marketing person. Now tell us a little bit about what WRQ does, and I'd, I'd also like to know how the culture there differs from the culture at LDAC. WRQ at that time built connectivity products, so term emulation, networking protocol stacks, um, X-Windows emulation, a variety of different technical products for PCs to communicate with mainframes, mini computers, and servers, and things like that. Um, and WRQ the culture was very different. First of all, WQ was making a lot of money. So that always has a different feel. So the whole notion of having all the soda you wanted in the refrigerator, <laughs> tech workers take for granted now, but was was fairly new back, you know, back then for most companies outside of Microsoft. It also had everybody had their own offices. It was just a very kind of a luxurious place to work. And they treated employees really, really well. They did a very good job. They're and they still treat them with integrity that. and they still treat them very well. And they've traditionally had fairly low turnover rates and things like that. And Eldic was an aerospace company. So traditional, old line, hierarchical. There was a bunch of different, there was a, just a totally different quality, which is the difference between the software industry, the tech mm -hmm. industry, and I think the aerospace industry even today. It's a pretty wide difference. And did you enjoy the work environment there? Was it a good fit for you? It was great. When I'd gone to, to LDEC, you know, the folks in aerospace, I didn't have that much in common. When I'd gone to WRQ, there were a fair amount of climbers and skiers and outdoor people and, you know, people of a, of a similar sort of nature and, and some of a similar age, although I went from being now, the, you know, always the youngest in any group. I don't even know when this happened. I used to be the youngest all the time. And then all of a sudden I was the oldest and it seemed to happen in like a month. It's so humbling. Oh, I hired, I hired at... Um, at WRQ, a guy named Matt Hewlett, who's now president of Adam Shockwave. And he was 24 at the time. By that time, I was 30. Um, I was 32 by that time. And he was more competent. I was thinking at 24, I could barely tie my shoelaces. At 24, he was more competent than I was, than I felt sometimes than I was at 32. And so he went through this process of now everybody who was working with me or for me was younger mm -hmm. than me. And so it just flipped. And I don't even know when that happened. It must have been during those four months in between. It in is, between exactly. LDAC, I took the time LDAC off. Everybody got younger. Everybody got younger and I got older. What was it like working for a friend? Hmm. That was hard. I mean, in some ways it was great. Um, but in some ways it was hard. It was confusing about, am I a friend now? Am I, am I a, a boss? Um, I think for the most part it, we worked through those kinds of issues. But, and mostly because we didn't work directly together. Mm -hmm. And how did your career progress there? Um, for a while, it progressed really well. So I went from being, you know, marketing a single product to taking on a bunch of other products and being a product line manager and moving up through the marketing. I certainly developed a lot of credibility about the technical issues and the marketing issues and things like that and became, I believe, a significant voice in the company um, and just eventually kept getting promoted. But then... Um, 
then at one point, about f almost four years into, into my time at WRQ, it was between me, myself, who managed all of the newer products, and a friend of mine, a really good friend of mine who managed the older products, about who would replace this one partner and get the VP slot, you know, and the new board position and all that sort of stuff, and I got passed over. And so if you look at sort of the course of my life, it was the first time where I really felt mm -hmm. like, oh, my gosh, um, you know, this is painful. Mm -hmm. uh, it felt humiliating almost. Yeah. Um, it was a difficult, it was a difficult period for me. And um, it's interesting because, you know, I go through that now with some of our employees. Um, and that whole process is interesting because I can relate to it so clearly. Um, what do you tell them to keep them motivated? First of all, I encourage them to make their decisions for themselves. I encourage them to do a little bit of what I did, which is, you know, feel it. It is, it is mm -hmm. not a great experience, but you need to work your way through it. Um, but don't do anything rash, right? Because otherwise, this is going to be a painful thing for a lot longer than it is if you just sort of leave. Mm -hmm. And so I stayed around. For me, I stayed around another year and tried to be useful to the management team and tried to take on different leadership roles. But... But at some point, I realized this is not where I'm not happy where this is going. And I think you've also kind of realized in retrospect that at that point in your career, it was the corporate culture wasn't as good a fit for you yeah. as it had been originally. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and now I'm talking. I want to be careful because I think WRQ is a great company. I'm talking about the WRQ of five years ago mm -hmm. um, as opposed to the WRQ of today. Um, WRQ of five years ago was known as a great place to work but not necessarily an aggressive, ambitious company. And, you know, I'm about, I'm about challenges. I'm about sort of being aggressive and ambitious in that way. And I always, didn't always feel like I fit. Um, and so that became clear when I got passed over. And so the question is, what, my question to myself was, what do I have to learn from this experience? And I think I did learn quite a bit. It was what did you learn? Period. I learned that, you know, I learned that pride's not always tremendously useful. Mm -hmm. um, I learned that there are more important things. I probably knew it at different levels. There are more important things than success. And I learned that sometimes getting taken down a notch is an important mm -hmm. part of anybody's development. I don't think I'm here today if I didn't sort of take that to heart. I think if I just sort of glanced that off and denied that, in mm -hmm. fact, the things that caused me not to get promoted were or not real, mm -hmm. or, or not justified in some way, I just dismissed them all, I'd be in a different place today than I am. But the fact that I was willing to hear a bunch of that, no matter how painful it was, and decide, I want something else other than this. When you look back at that situation, can you, if, if you were the one making the decision, would you have made the same decision they did, or <laughs> can you see it? Yes, um, I can see it. I probably would have made the same decision I probably would have made the same decision. And what's interesting in, you know, it's interesting in my role now, I probably have made that decision before. Mm -hmm. Because I think for some people, in order for them to be really successful, you have to send them on their own. Mm -hmm. You have to encourage them. And for me, a place like WRQ was such a wonderful place to work and you know, it's such a source of community and friendship that it was, you know, it was a hard place to sort of get going on my own. Now, I don't know that they were thinking that way. Mm -hmm. But I certainly think that way, and I have with, I can think two or three people in the history of our company that I've said, hey, listen, in order for you to get what you want, it may not seem fair, but you're going to need to go out on your own mm -hmm. and do something else um, for you to, to get the kind of satisfaction you want out of this. And what's better about it now is I can have those conversations heart to heart, right. and I'm more inclined to be direct about them mm -hmm. than perhaps um, people were with me. Right. Says, I think there's a tendency in large corporations to say, this guy is tremendously useful if we can just keep him in these roles, or this person is tremendously useful if we can just keep him in these roles, that somehow we'll get the most out of them, and you know, whatever happens to their life, whatever. I think I've taken the philosophy as, if it's pretty clear, the person's not going to get, because of whatever, because of the environment, because of the way you've set up the company, because of the culture, they're not going to get what they want, then you need to tell them that early. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you need to tell them that often. And you need to have to explain to them that it's not fair. Right. That fairness is. is not part of the equation. It just is. Oh. So, so you, you left there after about a, a nine months to a year after this had happened. And how did starting Aventail come about? Um, 
I had some friends in California that the year before I'd helped them get their company started. And they had this idea for um, a piece of technology that we could OEM and licensing it. And I was pretty clear I had turned down a pretty significant job at um, what is now a very local successful company, um, Real Networks. And um, I went through a process there where I was really interested. And obviously, I love what they were doing. And I still love what they were doing. Um, and I really like the CEO a lot, um, and I spent a lot of time with him. But in the end, I decided that um, I just didn't want, again, to go work for somebody else. I just, you know, all money aside, all everything else, I had, I had to go through that process first. So then when I decided that, I continued to ski some more. And then some friends in California had this idea for this business we could OEM and we could build a small business around. And so I went down to California, I started the company, and then moved it back up here when I realized that I was going to have to, this was going to be my company, and I was going to have to go run it. Well, this was one of the first, first times when you'd sort of gone off in a direction when you didn't have a very clear vision of where you wanted it to go and where it would end up. Was that kind of comfortable for you, or was that uncomfortable? It was, it was uncomfortable. But I would say I'm not sure I always had a perfect vision in entering any of these things, mm -hmm. right? They were broad-based ideas that sort of developed over time. So it was, it was definitely uncomfortable. When I approached it, I did not approach it like you hear entrepreneurs talk about it, whereas I have this grand vision and the rest of my life is to make this come true. That was definitely not the case. I approached it with some trepidation, like, okay, I'll do this for a month and see how it goes. Um, and so what I found myself is as I moved more into the process um, and then recruited um, my co-founder and some other folks, um, I found myself, at one point there was a shift. And, and that was a really a fundamental point. It was a point in which I realized that even if this failed, that I would go do it again. Mm -hmm. And that's when I sort of realized that I was wired for this activity, that this was a journey that could challenge me emotionally, mm -hmm. spiritually, and intellectually. And that's when I could frame it up as, you know. And then I started, I think my early language around starting the company was around expeditions, around, mm -hmm. you know, you just get up every day and, you know, you put in, you know, you put in your hours worth of work to move and get further and that sort of stuff. And you just pace yourself. It's not like you're trying to go. So I was able to sort of think about it that way. Um, did I answer the question? Yeah, you did. I don't even remember what the question was. <laughs> uh, when, when the company started, you sort of had 11 people working out of your house. Did, did you like that at all? Did I like it at all? <laughs> yeah, there were parts of it I liked. There were parts of it I definitely did not like. Because a, a couple of the engineers like to get in at 5 in the morning. And so they would be in and working, and they'd come in before I, before I even got up. Um, it was hectic. If you'd been married with kids, it would have been impossible. Mm -hmm. We had coax. Running down the staircase, my living room, one of my bedrooms is a meeting room. People were in all over. But you know what? It's, it's so core now to the mm -hmm. identity of the company, mm -hmm. the origins of the company, that yeah. it was so worth it. It actually sounds a lot like the, the lifestyle you were living with Outward Bound, where you just <laughs> had that kind of communal living experience. Which... Yeah, they did not live there. They went home at right, night. Right, well, but I yeah. know. But when someone comes in at 5 o'clock and someone else is working until 3 o'clock in the morning, it probably felt like they were living there. Yeah, it could feel like they were living there. <laughs> It's, uh, it was a good experience yeah. overall. Uh, and then Aventail has shifted a lot. It's gone through a lot of transitions. Can you talk us through those? You said you started as sort of OEMing a product. And if you could explain a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah, sure. I think, I think one, of the, one of the things that, that I love and the folks who work at Aventail love is um, this ability to keep creating, to keep evolving the company. And there's a history of it. So when we started, it was relatively humble ambitions to OEM some technology and keep the business small and generate a fair amount of cash. But then when we raised money and we realized that, in fact, we had a really good team of engineers on board, mm -hmm. and that's pretty consistent. When you realize you've been dealt a really good hand, and I don't want to, you don't want to take credit for being dealt a good hand. There's a lot of grace involved with, you know, finding the kind mm -hmm. of people that we found and, um, uh, the people along the way, um, you realize that you sort of have to up the ante. You mm -hmm. know, you've dealt a good hand of cards and you'd be crazy not to play it for a little bit more money on the table. And so successively, we decided to go build a product which was riskier. We had only mm -hmm. raised $750,000. We certainly didn't have enough to build a product, but we built one anyway. And then we started to sell it and then we raised more money. Um, 
And then, if, you know, about a year and a half ago, we made what is probably the fundamental decision of the company, which is, so the company's about three and a half years old at that point. And um, we decided to take a big gamble and um, take our core software technology and turn it into a highly scalable managed service for building and running mm -hmm. extranets for large companies. Now, there's a lot of risk. First of all, you're working with these companies in incredibly intimate ways. First of all, we didn't know anything about service. We were software folks. But we stepped up to the challenge. We were about 120 employees at the time. Um, now we're close to 240 employees. We grew very fast. We were very successful at acquiring GE, DuPont, Kraft, mm. very large companies very quickly for our service because it met a need that didn't exist. But I think the legacy for the company is this notion of trying things and being willing to make mistakes mm -hmm. and failing at them. And I could argue you'd look at different successions of the business, and I tend to see our failures as opposed to our successes, mm -hmm. um, just sort of a natural self-critical mm -hmm. kind of kind of way about it. Yeah, I think sometimes so, it's recovering from those that, that makes you the strongest, just absolutely. as you talked about before. Absolutely. And we talk about that as part of our corporate culture. So let's be willing to make mistakes mm -hmm. and make them fast. Yeah, I know one of the things that I had sort of learned at Microsoft is that it's not about not making mistakes. It's about recovering from them quickly, learning from them, and moving on. But to be stagnant is just not, not an option. Yeah. And we've built, I feel like we've built a culture that's really, you know, very, very, very oriented towards self-examination. Is mm -hmm. this working? Will it not work? What strategy did it play out? Why won't it play? And, you know, I feel like it, that's embedded in the culture, that kind of thinking. So each new, and I think we're about to embark on another one coming up, it's just what I feel in my gut, each new sort of evolution of the company advances us. Mm -hmm. um, and that's exciting. That's really what's fun. But e even though things have been going extremely well, you still ended up having to do a, a bit of a round of layoffs recently. Yeah. Uh, how, how did that come about, and how is the company recovering from it? You know, I think we were as guilty as anybody else of planning for enterprise demand that we saw in, in the year 2000 to extend well into 2001, 2002. We also expected the equity capital markets to be able to fund any shortfall, you know, at reasonable valuations. Well, so we sort of, I call it, you know, it's sort of like the sucker play. If you ever saw that movie Brian's Song, and he describes, Brian Piccolo describes what is, what is his, what is his, what is his, uh, but his experience in college when his teammates played a joke on him where they called this certain play that would cause all of the linemen to go to the right and Brian Piccolo would be standing there to the left facing the entire defense of the other team. I think that's what many of us felt like in mm -hmm. the market. Like, okay, who changed the market so quickly? Both the enterprise demand part of the market and the mm -hmm. equity capital markets part of the market. And so we felt kind of exposed. And I think we've dealt with it really well, but we had to let go of Oh, 20 percent of our workforce mm -hmm. and just coming off of it two or three weeks ago and it's unquestionably the hardest thing I've ever had to do professionally um, and it's a lesson that it's a very painful lesson. I think we did it really really well and I know that sounds funny mm -hmm. and I think the company's stronger as a result. And what I think did you do about it that that makes you say you did it well? We took a long time to plan for it I think first of all. I think we took a special um, a special emphasis all the way through the process is to preserve the integrity of the people we're leaving mm -hmm. um, as well as the people who are staying. I think we did some innovative stuff around using our own recruiters to place our people outbound rather mm. than letting our recruiters go right away. I just think, we, you know, myself and our management team, we didn't, we were out on the floor, we were talking to people, we did a series of meetings that day, and then we sent people home. We just said, we took work off the plate. We didn't just say we're going to do more with less. Mm -hmm. We killed projects. We reorganized. We talked about it. And I think it, you know, people felt like we've got more confidence in our leadership than we had even before because I think people suspected it. I mean, there have been 70 companies that have laid off, 70 tech companies that have laid off folks in Seattle. So I think our folks were just saying, you know, we, mm -hmm. we know the numbers. We know how mm -hmm. this works. Yeah. When's it going to happen? And then how are things going now? I think they're going remarkably well. Um, you know, I don't want to say perfect. I don't think in terms of perfection, and yeah, and I tend to be more critical than less critical. But I think we've rebounded from that. I think we're focused on a direction. I think people feel more innervated. I think we grew too fast. Mm -hmm. It was very difficult. I think our decision-making process got bogged down. And I think now we're in a place where I feel like people know what their responsibility is and they can execute on it. And it feels actually feels like a really good time now. Now if the capital markets would improve, <laughs> my life would improve right. in general. So. 
And what over the past couple of years at Avantale are you most proud of? There's so many things I'm proud of. I think the things that the things that humble me the most are the things that make me the most proud. And I think it's just the quality of people that that we draw. I don't see. I don't. I would be terrible working in my office at home. I'd be a terrible consultant. I'm terrible working alone. I literally feed and draw inspiration off of the people that I work with. And I think the kind of people we've brought to the table and just, you know, just going around the office some days and knowing what people have done, the efforts they have made to pull things off is something that, that just mm -hmm. keeps me going. So the proudest thing is the kind of people we've brought on board. And you talked a lot about culture. And what kind of culture have you tried to create there? Certainly a learning organization, certainly one that's oriented towards trying things and failing at them mm -hmm. um, and trying things and being successful at them. Um, one that's oriented towards change and growth and one that's not sort of scared of the general adventure. Mm -hmm. I think we try to couch this whole thing as a general, you know, this is a general adventure. Are you prepared to go on it? Are you prepared to enroll in it? Mm -hmm. And are you prepared to participate in it? And I think most people are. And I, I don't know. I, that's the kind of place that I always wanted to work, so I always assume. And, and given we have such, you know, given even, even after layoffs and before layoffs, our turnover rates were so low, I think it's the kind of place most people want to work. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I don't know if this is, I think we just won best, one of the best nominated for best companies to work for in this range. Yeah, and so, impressive. Given, I mean, given these hard times, so I'm pretty pleased with that. How would you describe your management style? <laughs> um, let me start with saying I reserve the right to be irrational as a manager. Okay. Um, I reserve the right to have expectations that are beyond achievable. Um, because I think there's so many odds against you, particularly in a startup environment. Um, and now as we look at these days, what have happened that if you're not irrational in some of your expectations, you just, I just don't know how you get there. Um, so I think my, my manager style is I'm pretty demanding as I would be on myself as an employee. Um, I want to know how people think about stuff and I want to know how they're going to execute and I hold people accountable. I also think as a person, um, I'm a pretty compassionate person. I think that comes across. I think people sense my sincerity around stuff when, when, when we have difficult decisions to make and things like that. Um, so I'd say aggressive but compassionate. How's that? <laughs> okay, that works. And what are some of the important things that you look for when you're hiring people to fit into this culture? That they not be exactly like me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I look for people who are um, who've got a history of being committed to stuff and they're they're achievement oriented. I look for people who are smart and who are comfortable with conflict and challenging, you know, and like mm -hmm. to work with ideas. Um, and I look for people. Uh, I look for good people. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't. I don't mind having. I don't mind having. Everybody wants. A little bit of a Cassandra. Everybody wants people who are going to complain because they really highlight different things about mm -hmm. the business. And sometimes people who complain a lot are actually tremendously useful for the corporate culture. I don't want everybody to be. I don't want. To, I don't want you to have to fit into a corporate culture. So it's one of the things I always chafed on. So I want a fair amount of diversity. But I also want fundamentally. I don't want people who are malicious. I don't want people who are mean spirited. Um, so I look for those combination. So maybe I do look for mm -hmm. some of the same things. One of the things that someone had told us when we were doing the, the background research was that you expect people to do, kind of do what they can and not what they were hired to do, to sort of look, out, look outside the, right. the structure of the job description. Does that still hold true? It, it holds true, and, and it comes in something very tangible is I'd like everybody to think as if they're the CEO, mm -hmm. as their responsibility is so broad that if they see something fall on the floor, they're going to pick it up. But at a minimum, I expect everybody to play the role the manager plays, right? To at mm -hmm. least think as broadly as the person they work for. And if they can think about that as broadly, first of all, they can wear those shoes, and two is they tend to make the right decisions if they're thinking from that perspective. And plus is, you know, people have bet on me all throughout my career to do things that I was nowhere qualified to do. And I'm inclined to find people who are nowhere qualified to do things and put them in places where they have to do it. Because people, I work best when my back is against the wall. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of folks are like that. So. You talked a lot about leadership and how you got that very, very early on. Can you talk a little bit about the difference between management and leadership? Yeah, I would say, I, and, I, and to make that point, I would say I'm not always the best manager, mm -hmm. right? 
I think there are certainly people who are better managers than me. I'm not super process oriented. Um, I'm not necessarily very good at, at, at details. Um, I think managers build a steady process and manage to the process. Um, and I think leaders often, you know, set goals that are beyond first order process things, and they set goals that are that are broader. But I mean, there are good there are good leaders mm -hmm. who are good managers, and they're you know, and, and vice versa. I think it's hard to be good at both. It can by, be hard. by nature. Yeah, I mean, people would never accuse Bill Gates of being a good manager. No, but I as, don't think. But as a leader. But as a leader, it works. Whatever it is, it works. Yeah, hard to yeah. argue with. Uh, one of the things that, that you told me when we had talked was that kind of in your 20s you were creating your personality <laughs> and you, you wanted to make sure that you lived up to your potential. And then in your 30s you were sort of living on that, that personality you'd created, but by the end of your 30s you were wondering whether you had any potential to live up to. That was a tough ending of, the, of that decade. What, what do you see for the 40s? Um. I feel like I'm hitting my stride in a different way. Um, this has been a difficult time, so it's always, I'm very mm -hmm. close to the present. It's a very difficult time with the layoffs and the changes and really having to build, to continue to build a company through some adversity. Um, but, you know, people have said life begins after 40, and I, and I kind of agree with them. It's a different mm -hmm. kind of a maturity, sort of a sanguine perspective on life, and mm -hmm. um, it's different. I'm actually... I'm actually quite excited about my 40s. So. And what do you think you'll do after, um, as the Aventel experience sort of uh, winds down, whether that be 10, 15, 20 years from now? I don't think it's 10, 15, 20 years. These are hard jobs to hold, at least in this way, for a long period of time. Um, you know, I'm not one, I'm not one that has a, you know, that, that is able to, like I've said before, that I'm able to build a very good vision or a compelling vision. And so I really don't know. I do know this, is that when I leave Aventail, I won't do anything for at least six months. And then I think I'll be inspired again mm -hmm. for, for something. I don't feel as driven to go on a new quest again. Right. I'd like There are some other challenges, other different kinds of challenges that I'd probably like to undertake. Maybe you're just tired. <laughs> I can get tired. <laughs> this is a tiring. It's been a hell of a journey. Salmon have to overcome incredible odds to survive. Sometimes people can help. I led a research project on flow rates in a local stream. Working with research assistants from psychology and English opened my eyes to the complex relationship between science and public policy. Now, when I work with school kids at the UW Hatchery, I tell them the whole story of salmon, forests, streams, and human habitation. Future generations, salmon, and people will benefit from our research. It was a little intimidating at first, a sophomore working with so many PhDs. In the lab, I studied an infectious bacterium that is a major killer of people with HIV. I showed my data to Professor Cangelosi and we realized I had made a new discovery. Wow. If this drug-resistant bacterium can be treated, people with HIV will have a better chance of surviving this infection. It's pretty overwhelming to think that I can have a part in helping millions of people. I'd just like to know what you, the favorite peak was that you climbed. Uh, the favorite peak that I climbed. You know, the favorite peak I climbed would have to be one that we didn't make the summit. It was a peak called Janu, and it's in the northeastern part of Nepal. Um, we went there in 87, and it's about 20, just under 26,000 feet, and uh, it's an area that didn't allow any expeditions or treks in for about 30 years because it was an area where the U.S. government used to run guns to Tibet over this pass where the peak was near, right next to Kenjinjuka, if you know any, anything about Nepal. And uh, so it was, a f it was like a 20-day trek in and a 20-day trek out, and it was an area where nobody had been. And the peak was just beautiful. It was an incredibly long and undulating ridgeline. And we made it to about 23,000 feet, but we kept getting snowed on. But it was, such a, it was such a great expedition, even though we didn't make it. It was better than any of the ones where we had made the summit. So, Thanks. Yeah. If you had your uh, professional career to redo all over again, what would you do differently? You know, at, at some level you say nothing, right? At some level you go. I wouldn't do anything differently because I'm happy with, with what I've achieved. But I think if I had my professional career to do over again, I probably would have taken college more seriously. 
I would have taken high school more seriously. And, you know, I just think that there's certain, there's certain things that would have been made easier by getting a better college education or working harder during college and some of those things that would have been, that would have just been simpler. Um, so that's probably the only thing I'd change. Um, but everything else, things just sort of work out the way they're supposed to work out. You mentioned you uh, went through the executive MBA program here. Yeah. Um, I'm entering in the fall and wonder what advice you offer to maximize um, the business experience more than just cramming in the books. You know, I, the interesting thing about the executive MBA program is one is I think you tend to get, we t I think we got great professors, surprisingly good teachers. And it was easy because so many other folks were executives in the program like had executive experience, that if a teacher was going to be pedantic, mm -hmm. that, that was just not going to work. Mm -hmm. And they would drum them off the stage, and they probably wouldn't teach in the, in the executive MBA again. And so what I found was there was a lot of really good interaction, A, between the students and the teachers. And so I, what I found is I learned the most from the taking of what the teachers had to say in the small work groups and the study groups. And so, um, and I'm still close friends with two of the people that this is 12 years ago in my study group. So um, I'd say is pay close attention to what's happening in your group. I think that's where most of the learning took place. Where do you see Aventail in the next five years and what obstacles will you face? Uh, I think you always as a company face an obstacle every couple of years, probably that's about the right pace, of reinventing yourself along some sort of axis. So that continues to be how do you reinvent and how do you drive the growth of the company beyond its basic, its basic business. And so the opportunity in front of Aventail is enormous. We're sort of, the company is paving, paving a way for a different kind of service model for information technology, basically a utility service model where, where customers can buy what they need by the, almost by the drink. And so there are tremendous opportunities to do that, not just with the basic extranet kind of service that we have, but a variety of different services that can be scaled dramatically. And so we'll continue to be a service company. Um, we've been ahead of that curve relative to a lot of other folks and continue to look for new services that we can scale in that utility model. I'm learning to care for prostate cancer patients at a UW teaching hospital. I study cancer cells from those same patients in the lab. Being able to study the disease, care for patients suffering from it, and research new ways to diagnose it helps me to see the whole cancer care picture. I'm researching a way to isolate a patient's cancer cells. Then we can determine how to treat them effectively and increase a patient's chances of survival. That would be so exciting. The University of Washington Business School, located in Seattle, Washington, ranks among the top business schools in the United States. Information Technology Leaders is one of the many ways the UW Business School forges partnerships and reaches out beyond the university. For more information about the University of Washington Business School or Information Technology Leaders, visit informationtechnologyleaders.com. I'd like to close with a composite quote from several of the people we spoke with. The things I respect most about Evan are that he sees opportunities rather than obstacles and makes tough decisions without looking back. He knows how to keep the energy level high on a team. He trusts people to do their best given an exciting challenge and the proper environment. He expects a lot of everyone he comes into contact with, but he always expects more of himself. In that vein, he's not shy about calling you on a mistake or an error in judgment, but he'll point out his own errors first. He's energetic, insightful, and bullheaded and he knows how to be a friend. He not only sets the culture of the company, he also sets the conscience. I'm so proud to be part of what Evan's created. I think we can understand why that is. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>